welcome to to Young Russell in the States, which is the home of Krone Cup Classic, um, vintage only Krone Cup Classic in um, in Tulbach in South Africa. To a younger is it's 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 an awesome place. You know, this farm has been around for more than 300 years. It was founded in 1710. Um, we've been producing bottle fermented sparkling wine or Cup Classic here since the late 80s. Um, that's also kind of when we built the underground cellar, which was the first in South Africa. There are a few firsts actually with uh, with Twee Younger Salen and Krona. Um, we're the first ones to do cold fermentations in the 60s. Um, we're the first ones to make a site-specific MCC as well, the Kaiman Schat, which we're going to taste in a little while. Um, but before before we get into all of that, um, you would have seen in the video, it's it's an absolutely beautiful time of the year at the moment, you know, kind of spring has sprung like you saw in the video, everything is green and soft, you know, everything is kind of coming back to life. Um, the first swallows have arrived from Europe and they're starting to nest and breed on the farm again. It's, uh, it's really a lovely time. It's one of my favorite times where everything just kind of was at sleep, you know, the dormancy that a vineyard experienced during the winter time where kind of the I guess the earth inhales, you know, um, and all the leaves fall down and everything goes to rest. And then just all of a sudden, it was, you know, last week, two hot days, and there's like a little switch, you know, and nature just kind of warms up, like it's starting to inhale again, you know. Uh, we see that, you know, the vineyards are starting to bud, you know, they get these little white woolly knobs that are starting to grow out. Um, and all of a sudden everything kind of starts up again, you know. Soon it's going to be Christmas and then we're going to be harvesting grapes. It's a rush from here in out. Um, but yeah, that's, that's kind of what, what we're looking at now. We're about to um, nurture the vines as they start growing. Um, and then come early January, the, the, gra the grapes will be close to, to picking. Um, and then the whole process starts over and over. Um, the big thing while we're getting together is Cup Classic is kind of grown up, hey? we've come of age, we are, we're 50 years old, you know, we've been around for 50 years, um, so this is, this is our celebration. But I guess, um, you know, in South Africa, we all know Cup Classic, you know, it's, it's been around for such a long time. But we only really are starting to make inroads in the, um, in the more global environment and in the international market. Um, you know, I think, you know, you live somewhere in the States, um, you still think South Africa is a continent and not a country. Um, there you get a lot of that and you know that maybe South Africa makes a bit of wine. You wouldn't necessarily think they also make bottle fermented sparkling wine, um, similar to what Champagne does it. But um, we do, we've been doing so for 50 years and it's become an unbelievable category within the South African wine industry. So the process we follow is very much the, um, the kind of the traditional bottle fermented um, sparkling wine process. I guess like we know it from, um, from Champagne. That means um, we prefer to harvest the grapes. Um, it's, well, it's all hand harvested. Um, TJ, we like to, or at Krona, we like to um, do night harvests. Um, so how that works is we, uh, we get up really early in the morning, similar to Gemma, um, a bit earlier even, um, kind of at four o'clock in the morning we like to start harvesting, we like to start working. What happens as kind of everything cools down in the evening, the grapes become nice and cool as well. We normally start picking really early um, in order to get all of the grapes into the cellar before 10 o'clock in the morning, before it starts warming up. The reality is we are in the tip of South Africa and it does get hot um, in summertime. So we like to protect the integrity of the grape and kind of the finer flavors of it by harvesting the grapes cold early in the morning. Um, everything is hand harvested. That means we can do whole bunch pressings. That means the, the entire bunch, the grapes with the stalks included, kind of get conveyed into the press. We do a hand selection on it and then we squeeze the, the grapes in order to get the juice. Um, we, do a net, or we do a fermentation on the base wine where we convert the sugar into, into alcohol. 
um, we kind of let that base wine rest a little bit, um, a few months before we start doing the secondary fermentation inside the bottle. How that works is you start a culture, a yeast mother culture, you fill the already fermented wine into the bottle, include this yeast mother culture, the last bit of sugar will ferment out and through that you will get the bubble. Um, the wine then needs to rest for a minimum of 12 months on the, on the lease, which is essentially the yeast cells that will die off after time. They kind of settle to the bottom of the bottle. That's what, what, you, uh, what you have seen in the videos as well. Um, so the wine needs to rest for a minimum of 12 months um, before we start the riddling process. That is where the bottles are turned upside down and we turn the bottles down and slowly that lease will start kind of transcending into the neck of the bottle until we've got it surpoir, essentially upside down. And then we start with a process called degorgement, which means the neck of the bottle is frozen, that freezes that little bit of sediment, that enables us to turn the bottle around, shoot out that sediment, and then we can add the dosage just to finish off the wine, put on the cork, and then um, you have a bottle of Cap Classique, um, just to the process. The one thing we, we, are, we, we are unique in terms of Cap Classique with Krone is that um, we believe in vintage only Cap Classique. Um, that's the beauty about winemaking. You know, that's kind of what has drawn me into, into winemaking. Um, it's probably the only, the only beverage we have um, that, is, that can be uniquely unique, you know, and where, you, where the idea is to kind of celebrate differences um, and diversity. Um, this idea of terroir, site specificness, where you have, where you take essentially mother nature, you know, you kind of take the soil you have, which will give you a certain aspect the prevailing climate will give you a certain influence. And then you have all of these finer details, these finer um, influences, you know, that the year will give you, you know. It's been a wet winter this year and a very cold winter, you know. We had snows kind of on the peaks of the Sarensburg and the Witzenberg Mountains that kind of surround the Tulbach Valley where Tue Jongersellen is situated. So this really cold weather, normally is very good for the deep dormancy of the vineyard. If it gets, and it was a very nice and wet winter, so we had got good rain, so the um, kind of the water potential in the soil is, is good. The vineyard had the ability to rest. All of this kind of um, snow will melt and kind of fill our dams, which again will help us in terms of water. You might remember the drought we had a couple of years ago, so if you farm, you normally pray for water before you have dinner. Um, and then, um, then, then the season starts, you know, and all of these attributes kind of have an impact on the product you make. And at Krone we like to celebrate that. Um, a lot of times with this type of product, um, I guess especially also with the bigger champagne houses, they have this preconceived idea of a house style. Um, so you kind of, you know, it needs to taste consistent, it needs to taste the same. You need to know what to get or what you expect. We kind of turn that upside down. You know, we, we like the idea or we know how we want Krona to taste, but those finer nuances, those finer details, we, we definitely want to show. So we will see every product of Krona will have the vintage on it. So um, the year we harvest the grapes, that is the year that we will bottle and make that wine without kind of pre-blending different years in order to achieve a preset pre um, house style. So Kroner, the farm is situated in the valley of Tulbach, which is about an hour and a half's drive um, northwest from Cape Town. Mm -hmm. um, it is essentially a valley surrounded by, um, by two mountain ranges, so it's kind of an amphitheater. Um, Maybe you saw it in the video as well. So we've got the Sarensburg to the south and the kind of Witzenburg in the Langeburg on the, on the northern part. Um, it's a very interesting terroir. So what happened is um, kind of the, during the time when, um, oh, here we've got a map coming up, so it gives you a bit of an idea where we are. Um, 
What is interesting on this terroir, which makes it which makes it quite different and quite unique in South Africa, um, the all of the mountains in South Africa were formed during the, the folding actions when the platonic um, plates started moving. And kind of in the center of Tulbach, you've got the kind of coastal plate and the greater Karoo plate meeting. And there's quite a lot of friction. And through that friction, these massive mountains were formed that are around us. But also what happened through that washing action with the friction, the soil is predominantly sandstone boulders. Um, so our souls, I sometimes feel that I'm farming with rocks and not really with soil, if I'm honest. Um, every time you dig a hole, you take out huge boulders of sandstone. But because we had these millions of years of washing actions, they're normally quite small and quite round, um, and that is unique. Um, to answer your question in terms of the grapes, um, Roberto, we have 70 hectares of vineyards planted on the property ourselves, which we farm exclusively for our um, Cap Classique. Um, we only really work with Chardonnay and Pinot Noir, so in that sense we're quite traditionalist. Um, we do though also source grapes from a region just further down the valley from us, which is the Robertson Valley, where the salts change a little bit, they become a lot more limestone influenced, similar to kind of what you, I guess, would um, have in, um, in the Champagne. Um, and we buy grapes from, um, from that region in as well that gets processed here. So we mix those two. Um, we have those started, and I think that's what we get to just now when we started tasting the Kaimanshat. We are really starting to celebrate um, specific terroirs where we can see that the wines are completely unique. So I'll speak to you about that a little bit more in detail once we start the tasting of the, of the Kaiman's Rat wine. So um, the, big, the big thing for us has always been to work with cold grapes and then also just to, predom or to do exclusively whole bunch pressings. You know, that is, that is non-negotiable. Um, you're right, we work with Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. Chardonnay obviously being a white grape, Pinot Noir being a, a red grape. Um, Chardonnay, in my experience, gives you a different nuance. It normally is um, the variety that gives you more of kind of that biscuity, shortbread, um, citrusy flavor that you get in, um, in, in sparkling wines or in Cup Classiques. Um, I find that the Chardonnay that comes um, from, the, um, from our own vineyards um, in these really rocky soils is normally extremely linear. It's as if, the, as if the base wine and the resultant wine has got an unbelievable tension to it, which I really like. It's got very high malic acid amounts, so that's kind of where that nerviness comes from. The Chardonnay on the more Robertson side, where the, where the soils are a bit more um, chalky and limestone influenced, um, I find that the Chardonnay gets a little bit more wider, a little bit more creamier, but also these citrus aromas come through more. Pinot Noir, on the other hand, gives you a completely different flavor profile. It's a lot more berry orientated, a lot more strawberry orientated. Um, so we whole bunch press, um, we make a, you know, a brute, a white brute and a rosé brute. Um, and there I like to blend the wines a little bit differently. So. When we start, we should actually start, start opening your, um, your Krone um, the KB, um, this wine here, then I'll be able to explain it a little bit better. So if we make this wine, which is a blend of Chardonnay and Pinot Noir grapes, we prefer to blend in more of the Chardonnay proportion. Um, again, here in the wine, we look a lot more for kind of these kind of biscuity, um, um, citrusy, um, shortbread flavors. Um, on the rosé, though, if we make the rosé, let me show you this one here. Um, there I turn it around, there we predominantly work with the Pinot Noir grape and less Chardonnay grapes because I prefer um, kind of more the berry flavors on the, on the rosé, I think it works better. Um, having said that though, there are two ways of making rosé if it comes to Cup Classique or even Champagne or bottles fermented sparkling wine. You can make a white base wine and then at the dosage level you can add a little bit of red wine to in order to color the wine pink. Um, I don't like doing that so much. I prefer rather to work with Sanyi. That means also that's one of the reasons why we have more Pinot Noir in the Rosé. 
Um, the idea here is that we take the color from the grapes already doing the pressing stretch and we use that color um, to essentially affect the rosé color um, eventually. So we don't play at dosage level um, to kind of uh, have a rosé color in it. Um, so I, uh, the, the nice thing is for me there's more of a, puri uh, more of a purity in the fruit um, if you work with the Sanyi Pinot Noir grapes. Um, also the kind of the phenols are a lot finer in the wine, you know, so it's a lot softer on the palate. The one thing though that becomes a bit of a challenge is that it's quite difficult to, um, to find the right um, hue of the color because that's kind of again what the harvest gives you, you know. So if we maybe pick a little bit later, it was a bit of a warmer season, we normally find or we tend to see that um, there's obviously more color in the grapes. So the rosé might just be one hue a little bit darker than it might be the previous vintage. Something I, I really like, um, but um, that, that is one thing we, we kind of need to live with. Um, Blanc de Blanc we're going to speak to when we get to the Kaiman's hut. A Blanc de Blanc actually means white from white. So it is, you make a white wine exclusively from Chardonnay grapes. That is what Blanc de Blanc stands for. Same as you would have a Blanc de Noir where you make a white from a red. That means you make a rosé wine or a white wine for that matter, but it's ma been made exclusively from Pinot Noir grapes. If you've got the Krona Borealis with you, I think it's time for us to toast. That's normally a good sound, it's a good sign. This is the 2019 vintage. Um, it was, uh, it was a really, it was a, it was a great vintage for us. Um, we, it um, kind of the standout thing. So that's the one, that's the one thing if you're a winemaker, you know, you only get so many chances in your life if you think about it, you know, you have, um, of how many chances have I had now, you know, you only get to harvest once a year, you only try, to be able to perfect this, you know, once a year. Um, so uh, my first harvest was in year 2000, you know, and uh, now we're in year 2021, so I had 21 chances. And if I would have to go through all of my vintages, the ones that really stuck out for me were kind of 2013, 2003, 2017, and 2019 is really starting to shape up to be also a really kind of classic Cape vintage. Everything just kind of seemed to work right. You know, we had um, a really soft spring. Um, there wasn't too much vegetative, uh, vegetative growth. There was a bit of rain at spots. Um, but the main thing that happened is we kind of dodged the heat waves we normally see in early January, um, which we normally don't like so much if we make Cup Classique. Um, we normally see it, it's, uh, it normally arrives kind of sometime in January or February where um, you get temperatures that skyrocket, you know, it can get 38, 39, up to 40 degrees and then it stays hot like this for a day or two. Um, not the best thing for grapes, especially if you want to make, um, if you want to make bubbly, because all that happens is the sugar shoots up, the grapes uh, dehydrate a little bit. Um, you f lose the kind of delicacy of the flavor and worst of all your acidity just drops away and that's the one thing we like to protect um, with uh, cup classic grapes we want to protect the tartaric and the malic acid in the grapes that's kind of what gives the wine um, the balance and the backbone um, in terms of the Krona Borealis um, so to kind of for the more for the more wine geeks um, like myself um, the one thing I do like to do here is let the wine run through the malolactic fermentation. Um, so after the primary fermentation has gone through, um, we encourage that the malolactic fermentations to go through as well. So to give you an idea, um, these rocky soils which we have in, um, in Tulbach on the farm, um, they, give us, they give us unbelievable analysis. So by the time we harvest, you know, we've got pHs um, of 2.9, 2.93. We've got natural acidities that are 
between 10 to 12 grams per liter, but with a very firm malic acid, you know, so that malic acid at that stage sits anywhere between five to six grams per liter, um, which is awesome, you know, that's exactly what you want. Um, thing though is if the wine is, um, if the wine is on the lease for a year to two years, I like to break that malic acid with malolactic fermentation. So you break, it's a bacterial fermentation that really just transform your malic acid to lactic acid. Lactic acid is a, it's not a double acid like malic acid, so it's much softer and it's also quite coated, you know, it's a very coated acidity, so I like that for, for this style of Cup Classique. Um, and then the nice thing, it just adds an unbelievable breadth of flavor to the wine as well, um, which, um, which just makes it so much more interesting. Um, and then, you know, all these things, the other thing that's really nice about having more, malic, uh, more lactic acid in the wine is that it also acts as a preservative, as a natural preservative. So that is one thing we also don't work with is sulfur dioxide. I do work with a bit of sulfur on the grapes when they enter the cellar. But after that, um, we don't, we don't, there's no need to preserve the wine any further with sulfur dioxide. So for me, this wine is very much like I explained it. It's predominantly Chardonnay with a bit of Pinot Noir. Um, it's about an 80, 20% split. And I think you really pick it up on the nose. You know, it really, for me, I get a lot of kind of that finer citrus that comes through. You know, there's maybe even a bit of kind of that mandarin peel in it and then very much kind of these um, oyster shell kind of salty flavors. Yeah, and then really kind of that biscuity shortbread is starting to show. You will see as this wine matures out, um, kind of that biscuity flavor will just kind of become more and more pronounced and the citrusy flavor will start to, to uh, diminish more. The 2016 vintage on the Krone Kaimans Gat. So if you've got that bottle with you, I would very much like to take you through this wine and, um, and chat to you about this because this is something quite special. So the one thing I, I, I learned was, you know, if you, you can only make good wine if you know what good wine tastes like. Um, and even though we celebrate 50 years of Cup Classique, um, if I seek inspiration, if it comes to bubbly wine, I still travel to Champagne. Um, so it was, it was on one of these trips. Um, and look, we always understand, you know, kind of Champagne nowadays, which is kind of the big LVMH houses, you know, kind of from Krug to Verve to Moe and so forth. Um, but if, if one spends a bit of time in Champagne, there's this underground movement that started probably you know, well than 10 years ago. Um, where well you get these grower champagnes. So it's, um, it's, it's guys who own vineyards who normally sell their grapes to these bigger champagne houses. But nowadays what they do is they keep like the really special stuff to themselves and they make their own champagnes, you know, under their own family names out of it. And these wines are normally, you know, quite small and quite special, so they hardly ever really move out of Champagne. They really just get drunk there. And, um, you know, that kind of really resonated with me. And their idea is, I guess, very similar to our approach at Krona, where we really kind of want to celebrate vintage and site specificness and the finer nuances. Um, so, oh, I ended up in some wine bar in Reims called Au Beau Mogere, run by this Parisian couple a couple of years ago, and um, they were super kind. Um, that's the nice thing about the wine industry, you know, people are mostly always kind and very hospitable and everybody likes to share and likes food. And this Parisian couple was just like that and I probably spent the entire day with them drinking all of the grower champagnes just about which there were in, um, in Champagne because they stocked all of them and they had these personal relationships with these people. And there I drank wines like Marie Coton and Pure Lots and you know it was, it opened up a completely new world to me. So when, when, when we returned to South Africa, I knew you know this is something we need to explore with Cap Classique. And that's essentially how the Kaimans Gat Blanc de Blanc was born. I realized quite early that in order for us, if we really want to talk about the site and a single vineyard as a site, it would have to be Chardonnay. 
I feel that we make um, at that level Chardonnay in South Africa just lends itself better to express the soil and the vintage and everything around it. And then it was quite clear, you know, there's one vineyard um, called the Kaimanschat Chardonnay vineyard. Um, Bouchard Findlayson um, essentially was the first one who found it already in the early 90s. Um, I can't lay, uh, lay claim to that. Um, um, but it is uh, a region in Filiersdorp. It's on top of the, on top of mountain range. Um, is a valley, so these vineyards are grown in an altitude of 700 meters. This vineyard is also South Africa's second oldest Chardonnay vineyard, so it's an excess of 30 years. I feel that with age of vineyards, you can see um, a vineyard normally settles. You know, I, I guess it's like us, like everything in life. You know, you just kind of calm down and you feel a little bit more comfortable with yourself. And um, vineyards are the same. You taste it in the wines later. You know, there's a certain a certain depth and a certain kind of intuitive deepness that you normally can't find with a younger vineyard. Um, so that was our first, that was our, um, that was our go-to vineyard. We knew immediately that would be the right one. It had the age, it's got the altitude, it's extreme, extreme uh, remoteness. So we picked those grapes in order to make this Kalmanschat Blanc de Blanc. Um, the idea then was also to make it as natural as possible. So after we harvest the grapes and we whole bunch press them, the initial fermentation is a natural fermentation. So we essentially allow the yeasts that grow on the grape by itself um, in its environment to run that primary fermentation. Um, another thing what we did is we did the fermentation in a food dray. So it's a 2,500 liter oak barrel. Um, the reason for that is that um, it's twofold. One of them, I experienced that you have a better natural fermentation in a less inert vessel, like a wooden barrel, rather than a, um, a stainless steel tank. And then at the same time, I can still have a cooling plate inside the, um, inside the, inside the, uh, the wooden barrel. The water was quite specific. Um, because you don't really want to have um, any kind of wooden character on the wine. So I reached out to a, um, to a friend of mine in the Alto Adige in Südtirol um, called Peter Mittelberger. They have been coopers um, for, oh, for two or three generations already. And uh, Peter is, um, if it comes to wood, he's like me if it comes to wine. He's a complete geek. Um, and they've also got a completely different sense on, on oak and, and maturation and cooperages. So um, this particular wood comes from the Saarland um, because the, um, the climate in the Saarland, the oak is a lot more tighter grained than you might even have in France. Um, and uh, that's what you're looking for if you want to make something that's very fine. And then he's got advantages, you know, his seasoning drying yard is at two and a half thousand meters altitude in the Alps, you know, he's got super cold winters and then super warm summers, so the leaching effect is unbelievable. Um, you can choose where you want the wood from out of what size or what height of the stockpile. So I chose it predominantly from the top part of the stockpile because I know that you'll have a lot more leaching with the weather and the seasons coming in and out. And then uh, it's absolute craftsmanship on how Peter builds these barrels. So you kind of go to that detail to find the right Cooper for the wine. Um, after fermentation, the wine spends six months in the oak on the gross lease. Um, there's no stabilization whatsoever. What I do do here though is that I open the cooling to inhibit the malolactic fermentation. Here I really want to retain that linearity of the malic acid, um, unlike what I do with the Corona Borealis. The reason for that is because I know this wine is going to spend a minimum of three or four years on the lease before we start to, to, uh, to disgorge it. So the wine has got a lot more time to kind of rest and to integrate and to mellow out. Um, dosage, we work very slightly here. We only go up to four grams per liter. Um, and that's pretty much it. Um, so the idea, and very much a first for Cup Classic after 50 years, is um, South, South Africa's first um, site-specific, vineyard-specific Cap Classique, very much in the idea of a grower champagne. Wow.
changes completely. It's a lot more reserved. Um, the flavors become, um, uh, yeah, they're, they're, there's definitely no kind of citrusy line in there. Here's a lot more kind of this oyster shell. Um, I find there's kind of this um, small uh, kind of mushroom um, um, flavor that's coming out that's starting to show the, the, um, the, the age of it. But then if you taste the wine, you know, it's just, uh, it's got an unbelievable structure, minerality and layers to it, you know. Um, and then actually once you swallow the wine, you can see how, how the intensity, how that brightness, that flavor just kind of comes back, you know. In winemaking, a lot of times we believe that it's a form of art. I've recently under, started to understand that, um, yeah, I guess I always wanted to be an artist and then I realized I'm not good at it. I've got no talent. Maybe that's why I became a winemaker. But I quite recently realized that, you know, as a winemaker, you're actually not an artist. You're actually more like a gallerist, you know. Nature is very much the artist and you're just trying to put it all together that it works and that it fits. Um, but it is something that, um, that is very dear to us. Um, so we've been interactively also on the farm, you know, this, this place has been around for over 300 years. It's, it's got all of that history and all of that journey and all of the buildings that come with it that we um, decided to kind of celebrate that with art a little bit, you know. So our old, the cow shed, you know, where for many, many years the cows were milked is now a gallery where What If The World exhibits. Um, that's what I wanted to show you with a walkthrough, kind of our art, um, art arcade. We have found unbelievable spaces um, which um, just lend themselves so nicely um, to exhibit arts. We've got a um, art residency, so we've got an artist living on the farm um, kind of producing all the time um, who we swap around. Again, it's just it's nice, you know, it just brings a completely different angle to this, you know, especially if everybody wants to create something, you know, we want to create, we want to be creative. So it's nice to live in that space. Um, we just on the weekend, we had um, the 40 under 40, which was an unbelievably nice um, event organized by kind of the BMW Young Art Initiative and Joburg Art together with What of the World, where we exhibited 40 artists under the age of 40 across the African contract, and we had 40 young collectors who are under the age of 40 to kind of share a meal and, um, uh, and, and yeah, just, just have fun, you know? Um, just uh, do what we like to do. Um, now, our next project is very much um, to grow our Blanc de Blanc range. Um, so I've been working now for the last couple of years finding two other Chardonnay vineyards. So one on the farm that we planted specifically for this project. Um, and then one which is on the Ceres Plateau. Um, again, a very extreme high altitude vineyard. Um, so the, our next project is rather, I want to celebrate the site-specific Blanc de Blanc more. Um, so in time, there will be a Tuer Jonge Gesell in Blanc de Blanc. We've got the Kaimansrat Blanc de Blanc and we'll eventually have a Coolfontaine Blanc de Blanc as well, which are three very different sites. Um, the wine is made in exactly the same way and uh, hopefully you'll be able to drink them next to each other and you'll really be able to celebrate the differences in that wine.